When I was a child, every few months without any notice or any warning, I would hear the sound of a specific car coming out the dirt road toward our home. <laughs> it sounded like grinding gears and metal rattling. <laughs> it was one of those early 1960s ramblers. Uh, and I think the color was called mint green. Some of you watching this probably know those cars and that color. Uh, it was a unique color for an automobile. And as soon as I would hear this car, I would run out into the yard if I was not already playing outside because the car would pull up into our driveway and an old man named Reggie would get out of the car. Reggie looked like a tall, thin Keebler elf. Uh, he looked a million years old. But he had a kind face and he always wore this blue ball cap. Reggie only ever came for one purpose. He would get out of his car and he would bring me a small paper bag, brown paper bag, full of pennies. Uh, it was all the extra pennies that he had accrued over several months. And when the bag got halfway, two-thirds full, he would just drive them over to where I lived. And he never offered any explanation. In fact, he hardly said any words to me at all. He would just hand me the pennies and then get in his car and drive away. Sometimes my dad would try to catch him, uh, and, and it sounded like my dad, when he was talking to him, was trying to convince him to stop bringing me those bags of pennies, but I didn't care as long as I got the pennies, right? Uh, we would go to the bank, and we would get paper rolls, uh, and we would count out 50 pennies, and I would spend them at Hill's General Store. <laughs> and I can't believe I'm going to say this, because I know this is the kind of thing that makes you sound really ancient. But back then, you could get a lot of candy for a couple of dollars. <laughs> I can't even believe I said that. <laughs> Three dollars would buy you enough candy to make you really popular in the entire neighborhood. I had no idea why this ritual passing of the pennies took place. Uh, I was too young to understand just how strange it all was. I, I thought everyone had a Reggie that just magically appeared out of nowhere and showed up and uh, passed out pennies. And this went on for years. One day when I got older, my father took me to visit Reggie. It turned out that my father used to work some with Reggie, so he knew where he lived. And even as a little boy, I was shocked at what I encountered. I thought Reggie must have surely been one of the richest people on the planet to go around giving away money like that. But it was just the opposite. My father was disabled and raised me as a single parent. We didn't have a lot of material things, but we sure had a lot compared to Reggie. The place where he lived was one small single room, and I do mean small, bathroom and everything. Um, I have never seen, I had never seen anything like it before, and I have not seen many things like it since. And when we left Reggie's home, I felt so sad for Reggie that I didn't want to take any more money from him to spend on candy. And I kind of think that was my dad's plan for taking me over there anyway. But he knew it needed to come from me uh, in order to convince Reggie to stop. But that whole visit made me question, why in the world was Reggie bringing money to me when we should be bringing money to Reggie? You know, what in the world was that about? And that's when my dad told me how this all started. When I was almost four years old, I had a little black dog named Cracker. One day, Cracker disappeared from our yard and ran down into the highway below where we lived at the time. I remember hearing the sound of tires and brakes squealing on the highway. I also remember my father preventing me from going down and seeing what had happened. He told me that a car ran over Cracker and killed him. And apparently the driver of the car was so distraught because he could hear me crying. And that driver was Reggie. Not long after that, Reggie started bringing his bags of extra pennies. And that was my very first lesson on what a heavy weight guilt can be and how long some people can carry it. It broke my heart when I found out the real reason that Reggie had been giving me that money all that time. And you know, it still does all these years later. 
Uh, I wish that I could go back in time and, and tell him that accidents happen and release him from whatever burden or weight that he was carrying around about that accident. Reggie already had a difficult life. There was no need for him to be carrying around an additional burden of guilt. The truth is, most of us are vulnerable to carrying around things that we were never meant to carry. Guilt and shame are incredibly powerful motivators, and they can be easily exploited by other people. And people of faith are no exception. In fact, sometimes we're the most prone to carry around things that we shouldn't carry and sometimes we're the worst when it comes to expecting others to carry around burdens too heavy for them to bear. But my sisters and brothers, that's not the way of Jesus. You know, I still have so much to learn about the life of faith. But one thing I know for sure is that the way of Jesus is never meant to be unbearable. Listen to what he says in our gospel reading today. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am painfully aware that there are many people who have never encountered this Jesus. One of the greatest tragedies of the Christian church is that for all the many different ways that Jesus keeps being presented to the world. So many people never get to meet the Jesus who is gentle and humble in heart. So many people have been spiritually wounded because they've only ever been given a vision of God who is harsh, who is demanding, so hard that no one can ever measure up, no one can ever do enough. That version of Jesus does come with some heavy burdens to bear, sometimes too much to bear. That version of Jesus is a projection of our own worst impulses. That version of Jesus is often constructed from the guilt and fear that people carry around in their own souls. And that version of Jesus keeps showing up time and time again throughout the centuries in all kinds of faith traditions. And that version of Jesus is nothing like the Jesus we meet in today's gospel. If you are watching this broadcast, or if you can hear this broadcast, and you have been hurt or pushed away from faith in God by a portrayal in God, of God who only has heavy rules and guilt-inducing expectations, I want to introduce you to the Jesus whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. I give thanks for the kindness and welcome of people who introduced me to this Jesus at a time in my life when I was literally and utterly burned out on faith and wanted nothing to do with the church. I was so weary with it all. I remember telling my wife, I don't think I'm ever going to walk in the door of a church again. But there were people who introduced me to this Jesus and literally loved me back into the fold. And they caused me to finally hear good news. You see, the greatest evangelists the church ever has aren't the people who are always talking about Jesus the most. They're not even necessarily skilled orators or theologians. They're the ones whose humble and gentle lives represent the Jesus we meet in today's gospel. They're the people who welcome others who are carrying heavy burdens. The greatest evangelists aren't the people that we always get the credit for introducing people to Jesus. The greatest evangelists are the people whose way of being in this world helps others find the rest that Jesus is talking about in this passage. Did you notice how often that comes up? How many times Jesus uses that imagery to describe what he longs to give to his followers? I will give you rest. You will find rest for your souls. So my honest question is this, and I'm not trying to be mean. It's just an honest question. If the good news of Jesus Christ is supposed to lead to rest, then why is his church constantly exhausted and weary? Perhaps we need to get reacquainted with this Jesus. Perhaps we're trying to carry more cargo than we we're ever supposed to carry. Come to me, Jesus says. All you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, 
I can't think of any invitation that's more relevant to the times we find ourselves in right now than that. I told my wife the other day <laughs> that it feels like, honestly, sincerely, it feels like I've aged 10 years in the last six months. <laughs> she didn't tell me whether or not she could tell I look like it or not. <laughs> but it feels like that, right? We are all carrying such heavy burdens and the weight of so many things right now. How do we get through a global pandemic or a divisive election year when all the voices that we are here are here around us are anxious, angry, fearful? How can we endure without collapsing from beneath the weight of it all? Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's an invitation to be linked with Jesus and what he's doing in this world. It's an invitation to let go of focusing on things that he's not focused on. It's an invitation to stop listening to every fearful voice that wants to scream for our attention and simply move with Christ in the direction that Christ is moving in this world. Barbara Brown Taylor writes about this passage and she says, if you've ever traveled the world or even if you've read National Geographic from time to time, you know that there are two basic kinds of yokes that can be used to bear burdens, single ones and shared ones. The single ones are very efficient. By placing a yoke across the shoulders and fitting buckets hung from poles on each side, human beings can carry almost as much as donkeys. They will tire easily and have to sit down and rest and their shoulders will ache all the time, and their backs may even give out. But still, it is possible to move great loads from one place to another using a single creature under a single yoke. A shared yoke works quite differently. It requires twice as many creatures for one thing, but if they're a well-matched pair, they can work all day without ever laying their burden down because the yoke is a shared one. When the day is done, they both, both may be tired, but neither is exhausted because they work as a team. And then she goes on to say, plenty of us labor under the illusion that our yokes are single ones, that we have to go it alone, that the only way to please God is to load ourselves down with heavy requirements, good deeds, pure thoughts, blameless lives, perfect obedience, all those rules we make and break and make and break, while all the time, Jesus is standing right there in front of us, half a shared yoke across his own shoulders, the other half wide open and waiting for us, a yoke that requires no more than that we step into it and become part of a team. My sisters and brothers, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what's the, on the other side of all that we're experiencing right now. But I do know where we can find wholeness and I know where we can find the rest for our souls as we make this journey. It's called the yoke of Jesus, the way of Jesus. And it is a choice to make our lives about what his life is all about right now. It's not about guilt or fear. It's about love. It's about serving others right here in front of us who are also weighed down and struggling. Jesus invites us to be yoked with him. Think about that. To be yoked with him in the work that he started in this world 2,000 years ago. And in order to do that, we may have to let go of some things that we've been carrying for a long time. But here's my promise. When we finally start to carry what we're meant to carry, and when we finally start to share the load with who we're meant to share it with, it can make all the difference in the world.